Right now, save 50 to 70% off at Banana Republic factory stores and online. And 60% off absolutely everything at Gap factory stores. Save even more with 40% off clearance at Gap factory stores. And at Banana Republic factory, all flannel shirts $19.99 and doorbuster scarves $9.99. This weekend only. Search our store locator for your nearest Gap factory and Banana Republic factory store or shop us online. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit U, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leonard, your host. I'm a consultant to nonprofits and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities. You can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and Twitter. And I encourage you to comment early and often using the hashtags NonprofitU or at your service. You can also leave comments on blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit underscore you. The chat room is open and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you must open a listener-only account. You'll find a link to open the account on the episode page, and you can also email me questions at consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com or send messages through Facebook and Twitter. You'll find a nonprofit you face I'm sorry, you'll find a nonprofit you fan page on Facebook and the Twitter account is at nonprofit you, and we'll be qu- taking questions by phone and from our chat room at about the 20 minute mark. The call in number is area code three four seven eight eight four eight one two one. Today's episode is at your service. We'll be talking to young activist Crystal Soamimo and hear about her involvement in social justice issues, including strategies to increase the earning capacity of North Lawndale youth and their families. Again, we encourage you to call in with questions and participate in live chats at about the 20-minute mark. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Nonprofit professionals and community activists are especially encouraged to call in and share your war stories and strategies. As I said before, our guest for today is Crystal Soamimo. By the time Crystal graduated from college, she had at least five years of volunteerism under her belt. As a high school senior, she served as a tutor and mentor to at-risk refugee children in Houston, Texas. As a college student, She worked in broad-based coalitions to advocate against sweatshops. She engaged other youth in voter education and registration campaigns and started a public interest group for the university. She currently lives in Chicago and is actively working with a number of issue campaigns. Crystal works for a local nonprofit as the Community Outreach and Development Vista, where she builds resources for workforce development and for their North Lawndale site. She also plans to go to law school in the near future and pursue a career in law, focusing on issues that impact low-income communities. You can find a bio for Crystal on my blog, Nonprofit U, under Episode 8, At Your Service. Go to ValerieFLeonard.com forward slash Nonprofit U and click onto the episodes page. You'll also find very interesting slides that highlight her work in today's slideshow. So, Crystal... Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in community advocacy? Sure, yeah. So I'm originally from Houston, Texas, born and raised. Um, As you mentioned, um, I'm a recent graduate uh, of the University of Houston. I graduated uh, in May 2014 with a bachelor's in political science and a minor in education. I got involved in community advocacy during college when I learned about uh, an internship from TexPERS, and TexPERS stands for Texas Public Interest Research Group. Um, they were on campus uh, helping people register to vote and get up to the polls early uh, during the 2012 presidential election. Um, so I went out and I voted early on campus and I signed, um, signed some of their information that they had a, on a table and uh, I eventually I got an email from them about um, internship opportunities that they had for college students, and I applied for an internship, and then I started working on issue campaigns in the community and on my campus, and that's kind of how everything got started. Oh, that's awesome. So the Volunteers in Service to America, more commonly known as VISTA, 
It's a national program, and that was envisioned by the Kennedy administration, but actually implemented by the Johnson administration. VISTA is celebrating its 50th anniversary of fighting the war on poverty this year. Can you tell us more about the program and how you got involved? Yes, so VISTA, as you mentioned, stands for Volunteer and Service to America, is a part of a larger program, which is called AmeriCorps, and the VISTA program specifically is a year-long commitment to service at a nonprofit organization in a community where people like me are placed there to build the capacity and resources for the organization um, to help increase their impact in the community that it serves. Um, so I already had VISTA in the back of my mind um, when I, uh, when a colleague of mine, uh, when I used to work uh, on campus at school during my undergrad years, became one after they graduated. And so mm -hmm. I saw um, VISTAs, the work that they do, it seemed to be very noble and effective in the community. And I couldn't help but see myself doing that one day. Um, but I actually decided to act on, you know, actually applying and going forward with the experience after reflecting on my experience in public policy and issues-based campaigns. And I realized how important the component of community development was to the bigger picture and how um, VISTA would allow me to do that. So I knew it was important for me to see what pu uh, public policy and regulations and laws look like on the ground level with the nonprofit. Um, designed mm -hmm. to alleviate some of these issues that already existed in the community. And so becoming a VISTA really allowed uh, for me to do this. Oh, great. So you've been assigned to work with a local nonprofit to assist North Lawndale youth and their families to enhance their capacity to increase their earnings. Can you tell us a little bit about your assignment? Sure, yes. Yeah. So I am the Community Outreach and Development VISTA um, from our organization, and so I build the capacity and resources uh, specifically for the mm -hmm. workforce development team of my organization uh, for the mm -hmm. Rondell site. And so this involves building relationships with employers and other work development, uh, workforce development resources in the community, um, and reaching out to residents that live in many scatter site buildings, um, which are like low income and affordable housing buildings and holding events and reaching out to them and holding events um, for individuals who are unemployed and underemployed so they can become job ready and um, have access to employment opportunities. And so overall, mm -hmm. my role is to really help these individuals become more self-sufficient by helping them increase their skills and attain better employment to help lift them out of poverty. Oh, great. And I can tell you, as a North Lawndale resident, that is so much needed. You know, for people who may not know, North Lawndale is one of the poorest communities in the city of Chicago, and about 40% of our families are living at or below the poverty line. So I can tell you, thank you very much for your service. That is definitely needed. So what thank have you. you observed to been... Yes. Yeah, so what have you observed have been some of the greatest challenges in helping low-income youth and their families increase their earnings potential? So I've I've encountered several challenges, but um, one of the greatest challenges I've had um, was more or less an engagement um, issue, um, basically an engagement challenge with the residents that I work with. Um, and this has a lot to do with behavioral economics. It plays a really huge role, like you said. You know, mm -hmm. A huge percentage of individuals that live in North Lando live at or below the poverty level. So getting them out of the mindset of I can't and being afraid of change and um, not being so focused on instant gratification um, in terms of what they want and how they you know, manage their finances and making them see the bigger picture and what they can do um, to, to put them on a path that leads them to self-sufficiency. So engagement has been a really, really big challenge for me. Um, and also I would say another big challenge has been uh, something that's out of my control. I can, I can kind of alter certain things to make individuals more engaged by, you know, building that trust and relationship with them so they can open up more about some of their barriers um, as to why, you know, they can't, you know, 
make it out to an event that helps them with employment and gain skills. Like if they need mm-hmm. bus fare and just building that trust with them so they can open up more about some of the other barriers that they have so I can fix those issues. And so the engagement piece, I mean, that's, that's workable, that's solvable for me. But I would say the other big challenge would be the thing that's kind of a little bit out of my control is policy and economics. Um, mm-hmm. Like there's certain policies that are in place um, that affect the community um, that I serve. Um, economics plays a huge role as well. Um, so just the fact, for instance, that there's not a lot of jobs in the community uh, that of the residents that I serve is kind of an issue, and I can't really fix that. The fact that you know there's um, a lack of investment. Um, in this particular community in terms of uh, attracting businesses um, to build that economic growth there. Um, Because a lot of times I'll find myself like, um, you know, inviting employers who are basically concentrated in the West Loop, which is a more affluent area of Chicago or the near West, or a lot of the times just the north side of Chicago where there is, you know, a lot of investment and a lot of, you know, a huge concentration of businesses um, there that are offering employment. But, you know, the residents, on the other hand, they kind of have to go the extra mile, you know, to gain access to those resources in terms of employment and additional resources that they need to be successful. Mm-hmm. And so I found that that's out of my control. Um, but that mm-hmm. that's definitely played an impact on the outcomes uh, for these individuals. And so that, that I would say policy and economics has been a, a big challenge as well. Oh, okay. So what strategies would you recommend for communities and organizations to actually overcome these barriers? Yeah, so the strategies I would recommend uh, for communities and organizations uh, would be just realizing their own assets, their community assets, um, realizing the people power. A lot of times, like communities like North Londo, they don't really have much in terms of, you know, financial assets, but if you just kind of come together and harness the people power that you do have, I mean, there's a lot of people, and and just utilizing the resources that you have, I feel like that's a really good strategy um, in terms of overcoming, overcoming some of the existing barriers in the community. And then I would also say um, working with decision makers um, to make sure that their communities and their organizations are getting a fair deal um, when it comes to allocating more resources um, and investment in their community um, and just kind of being a part of the policy making and the law changes um, that affect a huge part of their quality of life and just demanding that investment in their communities and the tools to help um, organizations that serve those communities, I feel like, um, is a really great strategy uh, to help overcome the barriers to fight the war on poverty. Mm-hmm. So can you share some of your North Lawndale success stories with our listening audience? Yes, uh, I would definitely, definitely say one of my successes was holding my first uh, job readiness training and job fair event. Um, in the North Lawndale community. I was able to um, work um, with a local church uh, in the North Lawndale community that was nearby the residence I served and like 10 buildings. Um, so that it's mm-hmm. like central, it's a central location that all the residents can easily go to. And so I was able to work um, with a pastor at a church in that area to donate um, space uh, for two days for me to hold a job readiness training and a job fair event. Um, and so that was really great because I got that as an in-kind donation. I didn't have to uh, pay, you know, the organization didn't have to pay out of its pocket to get that. Um, and I feel like the community impact and the relationships built were really, really great because um, I was able to get uh, resources from all over the community. Um, I got a representative from the Garfield Park um, workforce center to come out and do the job readiness training for individuals to teach them, you know, interviewing techniques, how to be mm-hmm. um, successful once they get a job, 
Um, and also, I was able to get a representative, a photo examiner down from the National uh, Labor Relations Board to just kind of educate individuals on what their rights are in the workplace and what their uh, rights are um, in terms of electing a union, if they want a union, and what some of their rights are when it comes to their employers and how they're treated. Um, and then also just the job fair um, event was really, really great. Uh, I was able to get um, a lot of organizations that are hiring and then also additional resources um, like the Secretary of State uh, to come out to educate individuals on how to get their state ID because Sometimes one of the barriers of getting a job is that you just don't have that correct documentation um, needed to move forward with your job. So having individuals like uh, companies and organizations that are hiring and additional resources that I know um, are helpful with little things like that um, was really, really helpful for a lot of people. Um, and so mm -hmm. the community impact was really great because I saw that, you know, it really made a difference in a lot of people's lives and there were some successes out of it. Um, and I would also say um, holding a manufacturing info session and collaboration with a really great organization that serves the west side of Chicago um, called Bethel New Life. And um, basically just, the, uh, again, the community impact and the relationships built um, out of that manufacturing info session, I was able to educate individuals on, you know, the new trend of manufacturing and job creation and how um, middle class jobs are being created with the manufacturing industry and just educating them on the resources that are available with organizations like Beth and Life that are able to train people free of cost um, to get the certifications and licenses needed to get middle class jobs that will lead them out of poverty and help them, you know, gain self-sufficiency. So. That for me was like a really great experience and I feel like a lot of people got a lot of good information out of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say and one of the other things I, uh, it, that I would consider a success um, is just meeting really great leaders in the North Lawndale community. Like I've been building relationships with employers and organizations and I've been able to meet a lot of leaders in North Lawndale who are really out there trying to make a difference. And, they changed my perspective on things. They helped educate me on a lot of things, you know, not being from um, the North Lawndale community, not even being from Chicago. So just being around them and just learning how to be a really, really good follower um, <clears throat> really helped me throughout the process um, because I learned things that helped me, you know, be more successful at my job, which in turn, mm -hmm. you know, created better outcomes. So that by itself, you know, it's general, but I feel like that. That was also a <laughs> well, Awesome, awesome. And again, thank you for your service in North Lawndale. You know, you and I are working together on a committee that is going to be doing community planning across several quality of life sectors in North Lawndale. And you have definitely made a huge contribution and you are very, very well respected by, by your peers on, on the committee. So thank you again. No problem. So thank you so much. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> your activism, it began in earnest in high school when you started tutoring and mentoring refugee children in your hometown of Houston. So how did you get involved and what were some of the lessons learned and some of the outcomes? Yeah, so interesting for me, like I got involved because the high school that I went to, um, it was an international studies uh, high school. Um, and one of the requirements actually for graduation is that we do a community service project. And that community mm -hmm. service project um, was, uh, had to be targeted towards what we wanted to do in terms of a career in the future. Um, so it was a requirement for us to seek out a project, and so I did. I learned about um, the organization where I mentored at rich refugee youth after school um, at a fair on campus. And so when I saw, you know, that organization, uh, in the back of my mind, I was like, it immediately clicked for me. I already had, like, an interest in education and some of the issues in the education field. And then also, I was already interested in international studies. I went to an international high school. So I was already, you know, drawn um, to that particular project. And so I went forward with it. 
Um, and so I learned a lot of things uh, being a, a volunteer, community volunteer. I learned basically the big thing that I learned um, is the importance of being involved in this community um, and the tremendous impact that it makes. I mean, it may seem like really mm -hmm. obvious, like, oh, you went out and volunteered in this community. Of course, that's important to you. But, like, I don't think that if I, maybe if my school didn't, make it a requirement, I don't think I would have had that experience. I don't think that would have clicked mm -hmm. to me and saying, okay, yeah, it's important for me to help out and do things in my community to help people who are a little less fortunate. Um, so I really learned how important that is because you do make an impact in the lives. I didn't realize it at the time, but I did make an impact um, in some of the lives of the students um, that I mentored and tutored. Um, whether it's just like helping them with their homework or just teaching them little um, things that, you know, you know, that's appropriate in American culture, just getting them assimilated to the things that we do and how we think. I mean, it makes a really huge difference in terms of how, you know, they adjust to their environment and how they feel comfortable in their mm -hmm. environment and, and eventually just it contributes to their success in the future. And so, yeah, I would say that was definitely a lesson learned for me, just being involved in the community and how that really makes an impact. Mm, okay, great. And and the work you do is so developmental, it's it's hard sometimes to see an immediate impact. Right. But um, right. Clear, yeah, clearly your work has made an impact as you can look back and see over time, and that's great especially since you're so young. It's wonderful to be able to see the fruits of your labor at such a young age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as a college student, you were one of the organizers of the Houston United Students Against Sweatshops. Can you tell us more about this coalition and some of your issues and actions and the outcome of your work? Sure, yeah, so I got involved with uh, Houston United Students Against Sweatshops um, through recruitment, basically. I was already involved on campus with another organization um, that I created, and I they reached out to me uh, via email, and I learned about um, the issues of sweatshops and some of the organizing that was going around it, and some of the people on um, on my campus at the University of Houston that was actively working on the issue of sweatshops. Um, and so I worked with the president of the student chapter um, of Houston United Students Against Sweatshops um, at UH. Mm -hmm. And so basically what we, we did was educate the public about the working conditions um, in factories um, and the need for coalition building um, to help garment factory workers receive a living wage. So basically, um, teaching people to support ethically made clothing, ethically made collegiate apparel, to put pressure on other companies that are not necessarily following that trend so they can um, basically putting consumer pressure on them so this affects their, you know, their profit margin and pressuring them to do the mm -hmm. right thing. So all workers are, you know, getting paid a living wage and are working in, you know, safe working conditions. Um, so that's what we did. It was a lot of um, educating the public and engaging the public and also organizing um, the president of our university and uh, the manager of the bookstore so they can actually, you know, cut contracts with companies that are, you know, are well known, that are documented to use sweatshops, you know, um, in their factory. Um, and also not pay their workers a living wage and just kind of pressure them to like cut contracts with them and just increase, you know, their relationship and increase the amount of ethical apparel that they carry in our bookstores. And so we did a lot mm -hmm. of actions with that, like emailing um, the president to try to arrange a meeting so we can get that done and working with the um, manager of the bookstore. Um, and so working with this group ultimately allowed me to become a coalition partner with Solidarity Ignite, um, Alliance for Global, Global Justice, and um, this relationship allowed me to travel to the Dominican Republic and Haiti um, to experience firsthand from factory workers uh, their experiences in the industry, factory workers who've had that experience 
working in a sweatshop and not being paid, you know, a living wage and mm -hmm. not being treated fairly and have unsafe working conditions. And also some of these factory workers were able to come together and organize and create a union so they do get paid a living wage. And one of those um, uh, uh, factories is called Alta Gracia. Um, they make uh, collegiate apparel and they're so far the most well-known um, factory uh, that is well known to pay their workers a living wage and treat them fairly. And so we actually went to that factory and saw firsthand um, the changes and their experience. And so that was a really great uh, experience for me. And I also, during this trip, I received a lot of training to help me build um, the campaign on campus mm -hmm. once I got back. So it was also, you know, a learning experience for me. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was a great experience. I learned so much um, in the realm of, you know, um, labor, labor unions and organizing um, during that experience. Oh, that's great. That's great. So also, as a student at the University of Houston, you served as the vice president of the school's chapter of the, Free, the Texas Freedom Network. In this capacity, you organized the Texas Rising Civic Engagement Campaign on campus, and you helped the youth to increase their voter turnout in Texas, and you also provided education for students and um, other uh, voter education as well as education about policy issues. Can you tell us how you went about organizing the campaign and some of the strategies you used for voter education and turnout? Yeah, so um, the Texas Rising Civic Engagement campaign on campus was basically an offshoot of my internship experience. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I, like you said, I was the vice president, so like with my internship, um, we were able to create a student chapter on campus. And so it was an offshoot of that. Um, and some of the issues that we worked on um, were like reproductive justice, um, some of the uh, textbooks that are approved um, by the State Board of Education and subjects like science and social studies. And we worked on some issues on LGBT inclusion and equality. So those were the issues that we you know, were initially working on um, on campus. And so that was more or less an offshoot of the work that we were already doing. And so we came together and created the Texas Rising Civic Engagement, which is, was more of a training um, on campus. Um, and we pretty much uh, recruited individuals and brought them together in a room and educated them, um, educated them on policies behind the issues and the importance of showing up to the polls. Um, mm -hmm. And we just kind of reinforced times like Texas is ranked dead last in voter turnout um, and even higher in terms of the youth voter turnout. And this has a lot to do with some of the policies that were put in place that, you know, restrictive voter ID laws um, and just kind of educating them as, as, as to what uh, with other organizations who were doing similar work um, and who were also working on civic engagement, um, voter issues, and just bringing them all together, bringing all the leaders together in one room and getting them all on the same page um, to basically help increase youth voter turnout um, in Texas, since that's been like a huge issue uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, um, <clears throat> can you share three lessons learned in your advocacy and civic engagement? Sure. Um, so one lesson that I learned, uh, one big lesson, is that relationships matter when building a movement. Um, when I first started off as an intern for TechSperg, um, I was a real newbie in terms of, you know, I was working on the student aid campaign, Don't Double My Rate um, campaign uh, to prevent mm -hmm. student loan interest rates from doubling. So I was really new at organizing, so I made like a ton of mistakes, which is completely normal. But I Eventually, I realized how important it is to build relationships with individuals um, in terms of making that movement successful. So I learned it was a lot of give and take, and you know, not necessarily saying, you know, oh, I'll do this for you if you do that for me, but more or less just like showing your support for other leaders on campus and for other organizations and helping them out, and then in turn just inviting them and educating them on some of the issues that 
you know, I was involved in really made a difference later on, you know, once I got better um, at advocacy and, you know, and civic engagement. So just building relationships. And then um, mm-hmm. another thing I learned is doing your homework, um, doing your homework on all the issues. Um, and I learned that uh, doing your homework helps you become more strategic and it helps you win. Um, so that was a really big thing for me. It's like you can't really go out there and work on a campaign when you don't really know much about it. So it's just like taking the time to like fully like educate yourself on, you know, what's going on before you kind of go and throw yourself out there. It really makes you better at your job. Um, and then the last thing I learned um, is just having passion, having a passion for what you do and also just surrounding yourself with others that have that same passion. Um, I've, you know, when I first started off, like, organizing on issues, like, I've made the mistake of just trying to, like, recruit some of my, some of my friends who really just didn't have an interest in political stuff, even though I would, like, you know, tell them some of the really horrible things that are happening that may affect you. But it's like you can't force someone who doesn't really have that same passion to be a part of your movement. You have to right. go with like-minded individuals who are already doing the same thing because ultimately that just makes you better at what you're doing and it just makes the movement better. Um, so just mm-hmm. having a passion, like not working on something that you you're not really interested in and, you know, trying to engage people who aren't really interested in it. So just having a passion for what you're doing and surrounding yourself with people who have that same passion is a big thing for me that I learned. Right. And and that's really, really good advice. And I would say that the same advice goes for nonprofits who are um, doing board development. If you're starting a nonprofit, mm-hmm. it's very important to make sure that the people in leadership actually buy into the mission and they're not just joining a board or some committee just because they like the leader. You know, they, they have to really like the cause and be passionate in order for the organization to sustain itself over the long term. Right. So, as, yep, it's right, as, amazing. Something I learned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. As an activist in North Lawndale, one of the greatest challenges that I see is getting young millennials involved in the civic affairs of our community. I mean, they may be involved, but it's hard for them to work right alongside with the more mature adults. Um, you and I are working together on a community planning process, and you kind of see you know, from that room, what I'm talking about. You know, you're the youngest person <laughs> there. And, and we and we really need to get more young bodies involved. So how do we get more millennials like yourself involved in communities like North Lawndale? And not that they're not involved, but how do we make sure that we can have coalitions that um, go beyond age boundaries, you, you know what I mean, have multi-generations right. working side by side? Yeah, so overall the answer would be being strategic. So like just going in and doing your research um, specifically on millennials and figuring out what millennials like and what millennials want. Um, being a millennial myself, I feel like I don't speak for everyone, but for the most part, millennials, um, don't have any boundaries. They don't like to set any boundaries for themselves. The sky is the limit. <laughs> this is true. We, you know, we, we do whatever we want. We're kind of self-centered, you know, we're on Facebook, social media. We like to speak our mind a lot. Um, so being really strategic in that, like just going where we are, um, because a lot of my peers that are my age, I'm a little, you know, abnormal in this case. Like I kind of put myself out there, you know, regardless of people's ages, but I know a lot of my friends are very hesitant in terms of speaking with individuals who are older than them because it's kind of like, you know, like they're talking to their parents or something like that. Like they find a really hard time like relating to older individuals. So just I would, my advice for individuals like you is just to go where we are, like go to our events and support us and our mm-hmm. causes. And, um, that 
that by itself um, would definitely, you know, get build that relationship with millennials and get them on board um, with what the older generation is doing, um, and just empowering them. So a lot of the times, like for me personally, I can't speak for everyone. I feel like a lot of older individuals, uh, I don't know because maybe because they've experienced life more and they've gone through a lot of things. A lot of the times they speak in terms of like, I, you can't or you can't do this. And for me, like, I don't think that way. I think this guy's <laughs> the limit. There's unlimited possibilities. Don't tell me I can't do anything. Tell me what I can do. So just em empowering young individuals and not, you know, telling them to settle for this or you can never change this. I think that coming with an attitude of this empowerment um, would really get millennials engaged in the community affairs and civic affairs process um, and you'd be more than willing to start working around um, more adults. Okay. That is definitely great advice. Um, <laughs> we do have, we have a couple questions from our chat room. Um, I want to share with you. Um, the first question is, have you been able to get involved in any issue campaigns here in Chicago beyond the work that you do with VISTA? Yes, I have. So before I started as a VISTA, um, I worked on several campaigns. Um, one of them, the first uh, campaign I worked on, um, was an environmental campaign on protecting the waters of Lake Michigan and so educating the public on some of the pollution um, that, you know, Lake Michigan is experiencing by big uh, companies um, and just educating them on some of the things that the EPA is trying to do um, was one uh, campaign that I worked on. And then another one, one that I really, really liked uh, was working on a campaign um, which was basically focused on raising the state minimum wage. So I went out um, mm -hmm. and canvas and organize universities and schools and their students on the campaign and educating them on why it's important to raise the state minimum wage. Um, so that was really great and just uh, getting people registered to vote um, and then getting them out to the polls uh, was, is a, was a really great experience for me. And during that experience, I was also kind of building the momentum and support um, for uh, other issues like having an, uh, an elected school board, which is a really big issue here, specifically in Chicago, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. that you guys don't have an elected school board despite so many other cities having that. And so just educating people on why it's important to have an elected school board because, you know, it's more representative of, you know, the neighborhoods and the areas um, that a lot of these, you know, especially underdeveloped communities where a lot of these youth live and just having that, you know, democratic process and just educating people on as to why that's important. And so, you know, mm -hmm. have any more massive school closures uh, without the consent of the community. Um, so that was a really great campaign. So just generating support um, on campaigns, local campaigns was another thing that I did here in Chicago before mm -hmm. I started as a VISTA. Okay, awesome. And we have time for one more question. and. This one is, what advice would you give to young high school students who may want to get involved in their communities? Ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a tough answer, but I would say um, volunteer work, going out and volunteering in the community, um, I feel is the best way to go about it, going to like your local community center, um, just being involved, immersing yourself, um, and the issue, like showing up to like a city council meeting um, is one thing, but I would definitely say just immersing yourself into what's going on in the community and being involved in the community. And that, I feel, starts with volunteering and being at service in your community. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we've come to the end of our show, and I'd like to thank Crystal Soamimo, a local activist, for being my guest today. 
Crystal, would you care to share any parting thoughts and tell us how we can reach you and most importantly, how we can get involved? Yeah, so I would like to thank you so much, Valerie, for inviting me onto your show. I really appreciate it. I, I personally admire you so much. Um, I, I, I remember, like, when I first learned about you, I was kind of just stalking you online and just reading about some of the stuff you were doing. So, And you were doing really great stuff, so I always wanted to work with oh. you. So thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. Um, and, yeah, mm-hmm. I definitely... You can reach out to me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page, um, and I also have a LinkedIn page. And and how you can get involved, definitely just start with your community. Um, volunteer at, like, your local school, elementary school, or your, your local community center is, like, the best place to start in terms of getting involved. Hmm. Okay, great. You know, you are such an old soul. And when I say that, I, I don't mean that condescendingly. You're wise beyond your years. So I, I thank you so much for sharing your nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so thank you for listening to Nonprofit You Blog Radio Talk Show. The show will be available for download within about an hour. Be sure to tune in next week when our next guest will be Ileana Sarano of the U.S. Census Bureau. She'll provide an overview of the new updates to the census.gov website and share ways nonprofits, small businesses, and activists can use the data. I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion. See you next week. Now save 50 to 70% off at Banana Republic factory stores and online. And 60% off absolutely everything at Gap factory stores. Save even more with 40% off clearance at Gap factory stores. And at Banana Republic factory, sweaters start at $19.99 and scarves start at $9.99. Hurry! Search our store locator for your nearest Gap factory and Banana Republic factory store or shop us online. Right now, save 50 to 70% off at Banana Republic factory stores and online. And 60% off absolutely everything at Gap factory stores. Save even more with 40% off clearance at Gap factory stores. And at Banana Republic factory, sweaters start at $19.99 and scarves start at $9.99. Hurry! Search our store locator for your nearest Gap factory and Banana Republic factory store or shop us online.